Uh, my name is Marshall Clow. I work at Qualcomm in San Diego. I, I'm on the standards, the C++ standards committee, I'm working on the standard library. Um, I've been contributing to Boost for a long time, for maybe a, do a dozen years. And um, today I'm going to talk about the detection idiom. Um, and I have to admit that the title of my, um, my talk is a little misleading. It's not actually a better way to spin A, it's a better way to write your spin A conditions um, so that they're easier to understand, they're simpler, they're, they're not just impossible to read. Sure. That's not usually a problem for me, being too soft. Um, anyway, um, due to space on the slides, um, I'm not actually be going to be doing any spinning in this talk. I'm just going to be using static assert to demonstrate that here's a condition that you can then pass to enable if or whatever technique you want. Okay? Um, but that's, that's the use for this, is to, um, is to enable you to enable and disable various overloads and so on depending on conditions. Okay. Helps if I turn this on. Okay, the detection idiom, we'll talk about what is it, what problem does it solve, what does it look like, how does it work, and how can I use it? Five basic things that we'll talk, that we'll go through, and hopefully at the end of this hour and a half, you will have a really good idea of how you can use it, and you'll understand how it works. If you have any questions along the way, let me know. Don't save them for the end. Put your hand up, and I'll try to answer them right away. Occasionally, I will say, that's a really good question, and I have an answer coming up in two slides, and then I won't answer it for a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, what is the um, the detection idiom? The detection idiom is something that um, Walter Brown developed as part of his uh, um, part of his work for on the library fundamentals um, technical specification. It appeared in the second version of Library Fundamentals TS. Um, it's not really called out at all. There are no examples. There's no explanatory text. It's basically mentioned, well, there are a couple examples, I should say. It's basically spelled out in the synopsis in the Library of Fundamentals TS document. There are a couple examples. Um, but there's no, there's no, okay, so I can do that too. Um, anyway, um, there's no examples, there's no, there's no text that says anything about why you would, be, why you would care about this or what you would, um, why you would use it. Um, it's basically two structs, um, an, exp an exposition-only class, and then a, a couple of type traits-like structs. And that's it. And you look at it and you say, why would anybody do this? What's the whole point of this? And we'll walk through. And I'll show you what they are. They're small enough that they'll fit on like three slides. And we'll talk about all of them. Okay? Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Where did it come from? Walter Brown. Gentleman who's been on the Standards Committee for a long, long time. He used to work, I believe, at the, uh, at the Fermi, at Fermilab outside of Chicago. He lives outside of Chicago. Um, he wrote up, wrote up a bunch of papers, one, two, three, um, proposing it and refining it. And then... Um, he also has a pair of topic, a pair of talks at CPPCon a couple years ago about template metaprogramming in general, and he spends some time um, describing how void T and the detection idiom works. Uh, he also has a, I mean, these are good talks. I have links at the end of the slides, so if you're interested in template metaprogramming, this is these are good talks to watch. Okay, so. In, the, um, in terms of what problem does this solve, so when you are, right, we've all done this, we, you, have, you write a template class or something, that, and you want to constrain it. You want to constrain it, say it only works for these particular types. Say it only wants to work for floating point types or only default constructible types or something like that. I mean, Boost is full of this stuff. The standard library is full of this stuff. And there's a lot of type traits in the standard library that do useful things. And if, you know, that tell you useful things about a particular type. You know, is this default constructible? Is this a trivially copyable type? Um, and so on. Is it copy constructible or whatever? And 
if the constraint that you're dealing with, if the, if the, uh, the condition that you, you want to constrain your code on is one of those types that, that's already pre provided, then you're golden, right? You just use, you know, STD is copy constructible T, or the brackets T, and, and you just swap that in your enable if and go to town. But sometimes it's more complicated than that. And this is a, uh, this is a quote in here in the middle from the uh, standard, the shared pointer documentation talking about um, a particular constructor of shared pointer. And T is obviously, is T is the type that, of, of the shared pointer that you're trying to instantiate. So when T is an array type, this constructor shall not participate in overload resolution unless is move constructible U, U is the parameter you pass in, the parameter type, is true that the expression D, D is the deleter of P, where P is the pointer, is well formed and either T is U sub N and Y sub N is convertible T or T is U without a uh, uh, size and this is convertible to T. Buh. You know, now imagine writing a Sphini constraint for that. Um, and oh, by the way, this is only half of this because there's another sentence that starts when T is not an array type. Um, anyway, there's lots of places in the standard where it says da 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 is well formed. And a few years ago, I spent mm, a few afternoons sitting and staring at the ceiling and then writing little programs. And basically I was trying to write a type trait that I called is well formed, where I could hand it a, some code and that it would tell me, is this well formed? Effectively, if, if I tried to compile this, would the compiler complain? That's a really powerful thing. I failed. I did not, I was not able to write that. Um, Walter, on the other hand, succeeded. The detectionism is basically a way of asking, is this code with these types well formed at compile time and not generating an error? If the answer is no, just getting back a compile time Boolean that says yes or no. This is incredibly powerful. How many people here have done a significant amount of template metaprogramming? Just curious. Now that I've described this, how many people think this, this, is, this would be a really handy thing to have? Yeah, exactly. It's, there's, there's lots of hoops we've all jumped through to try to get, you know, to, to try to, to get near this. And now Walter has come along and say, oh yeah, it's easy, just do it this way. Man, I wish I was that clever. Um, just as, as a shout out to uh, Louis, is Louis around here? Or is he over listening to Lisa? Um, Boost Hannah also has a is valid feature where you basically pass it a lambda and it says, is this valid, valid code? Um, so Walter is not the only person who's come up with this. Yes? Okay, so the question, the comment was, was that Boost Hanna also has a void T um, lookalike called, did you say when? That Louis uh, complain, Louis does not complain. Louis claims that uh, gives better compile time performance. All right, just a word about performance. I'll just, I will mention this once and maybe once other time. Um, all this stuff happens at compile time, happens in an unevaluated context. So this, generates no code that goes into your executable. Um, it has no effect on runtime size or performance or anything like that. Just FYI. Anyway, so yeah, is this code well formed? So you know, you you plug you could plug in this expression and and get an answer back. Yes, that code is well formed. Okay. Really simple example. I'm pretty sure that most of the people in the room have written something that says that do this. Does, does, does a, a type have a nested member type def? Okay, not a member type def, just a nested type def, because types, we don't have member type defs. Okay, I've got three classes up here. Yes, huh, and no, and I'll be using these names pretty much for the entire talk. 
Um, yes, has one, huh, has one, but it's private, and no, does not have one. And this is how you use um, the detection idiom. You define basically a meta function. It's a, this is a function that takes, takes a type and gives you back a type. It doesn't have to be one for one. Take some number of types and maybe even values and, and returns a type. And then we have is detected, passing it this function and some parameters to work on, and it will tell you. Is detected says, yes, in fact, this does have a type, type def. Huh, has a type def, but it's inaccessible. So that's the same as saying, no, it doesn't, because you can't access it. And no, doesn't have one at all. So in the library I work on, before this, I would have you know, defined a, a dummy struct and two static member functions, one that took, you know, one that took a pointer to this thing and returned a character, and one that took dot, 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 the C style ellipsis, and returned something that was different sized from a character, and then I could say size of this function call, pass, passing it a null pointer, or zero, and get the answer that, that way. And then, but I have to write one of those for every single type def I wanted to look for. Now you just, you, this is basically turning this into a framework. A framework of, you, all you have to write now is you write this test that says what you want to test, and then just hand it off to the framework and it gives you back answers. Okay, any questions? Just out of curiosity, how many people have, have seen void T before or have played with the detection idiom at all? Way more than I thought, because frankly, um, I have not seen very many people, you know, who knew about it. Once people learn about it, they get all ex enthusiastic. Okay, next. Um, a slightly more practical example, okay? Here we have yes and no, has a, has a, a type def, no type def. We have, again, we have the same kind of thing. We have a, the, the tech detection function we wrote. And we use one of the other pieces of the detection idiom, detected or, that says if t has a size, size type def, use that. Otherwise, use short. And we can, you know, make a variable of that, set it to a value, and start using it. And so it's, it's a way of providing a default if, in fact, the detection fails. And I, I will walk you through how all this works. Again, you know, there are other techniques. You can roll this by hand, certainly, but this makes it easy, makes it simple. I'm getting cut off here at the bottom, aren't I? Oh, well. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, here's a big chunk of it. Um, we have a, a class called NoneSuch. NoneSuch is a really boring class. But, you know, I've looked through various standard library headers, and others, every standard library has something like this. They call it things like, um, libc++ calls it NAT, not a type. Um, un, actually, double underscore NAT. I don't remember what libstud C++ calls it. But they use it for marking that says, this, this failed, or, you know, this is not, a, this is not an answer, the, the answer you were looking for. This is really boring, right? It's, it's a struct that you can't construct, you can't destruct, you can't assign, you can't do anything to it. You can't copy construct it. It's just a marker. This is the thing that, that makes this all work, void t. Actually, void t is in C++ 17, but not the rest of the detection idiom. Void t is, again, one of these meta functions. If you give it, it's a really boring one. Right? You give it a series of classes, a series of types, and it says, ah, yeah, okay, that type, that type, that type, that type, here's void. <laughs> That's all it does. It returns you void. This type, this type, this type, void. And that's all it does. But that's enough. 
Okay? Any questions about this? This is <laughs> really simple. Okay, then we have, whoops, did I go two? No, I went one. Okay, in the, um, in the Library of Fundamentals uh, section, it talks about a class named Detector, and it puts it in all uppercase, and if, you, if you're the kind of person who reads the standard closely, you will realize that when, it, when the standard talks about something in all uppercase like this, it usually means it's what they call an exposition-only struct. This is something that doesn't actually exist in your standard library, but it's used to explain how things work. And so if you go looking through somebody's implementation looking for a struct named detector, you won't find one. Now you might find one that says, you know, single underscore capital D detector, because this is a perfectly fine way to implement it. But you won't find anything with that name, because that's not a reserved name. And user codes, user programs might actually have things named detector. Um, this is also kind of strange for a type trait because it has both a value and a type. Usually type traits have returned to you a, a, a type, for example, add const, right? Add const of int hands you back a new type, const int. Remove const of const int hands you back a new type, int. Or um, rank, you give it, it, tells you how big an array is. You say, I have a type which is an array of six integers. What is its rank? Six. Um, things like that. Did I do rank right? Is rank the number of dimensions or the, the size? Extent is the size. Rank is the number of dimensions. Sorry. So um, got it backwards. So an array of six integers, its rank would be one, but its extent would be six. So anyway, we have two of these. The first one's really simple. Um, it just returns to you the default, and the value is always false. The second one takes one of these meta functions and some arguments and returns true and the result of applying that meta function onto the um, arguments. Okay, and we have in here, we have, here we have an always void, and here we have void t op args, which I'm going to explain in a little bit. So, but you don't ever use detector, because it may not exist, right? It's just an exposition only thing. These are the ones you actually use. Um, is detected, works as if it was Call it, it was inheriting from, or you know, in getting values out of detector, or detected T, which is the shorthand for getting the type out. Um, so what does it do? It says detector uses none such as the default. Void op args value T, okay, and detected T takes in none void op args gets you the type. So you can just ask, what's the type? Or you can ask, did the detection succeed? Or you can get them both. So so how does it work? It's really, really, really simple. Once you think, it, once you think it up, and that's the thing that annoys me so much about this is that I played around with this problem for a while. And then Walter came along and handed me this solution, and you look at it and you say, oh, yeah, dang, why didn't I think of that? Anyway, you provide the type function, and then you use is detected to apply the type function to, to what you want, and it returns to you whether or not it succeeded, and if it did, what the result type was. Um, but no, that's not really what I meant. How does it work? What does it do? That's a better question. So what does it do? It, it tries to instantiate detector. Um, and there are two, there are two templates for a detector with the types and the parameters that are passed. The first one here always succeeds. Okay? There's, there's nothing that's going to fail here because the value t is false and type is default 
That's always going to succeed. Okay, always successfully instantiates. The second specialization can be instantiated only if the expression op args can be instantiated. And if so, if that happens, then it's a more specialized version of detector and is chosen during overload resolution. Okay? Um, all this happens in an unevaluated context. No code gets generated. You just get the answers you want. We're letting the compiler actually do the overload resolution and doing this fin A for us to give us the answer we want. Um, basically, void T in this part asks as a wrapper, because we, we wrap this into void T, and so it swallows the compiler errors. It swallows the errors. It just void T fails, doing, fails because the, parameters to void, the parameter to void T is not a, um, it, in, the, in the failure case, is not valid, and so this fails to instantiate. Any questions about this? Everybody's either asleep or they, they got it cold. Okay, variations on a theme. Detected or, we saw that in one of the earlier examples, you give it a default thing and, it's a, and basically it says a default and your, your op and the args and it says if, there, if it succeeded, it gives you the result, and if it failed, it gives you back your default type. Now, if you look back here, right, if you just say is detected, the default is set to none such. And you could use this and see if it's none such, but detected or is, is more convenient. Um, detected exact lets you check the result of your type function. Did it, in fact, give you exactly what um, the type you were expecting. And is detected convertible, on the other hand, lets you say, the type that I got back, was that actually convertible to some type I'm interested in? So you can check, not only was it successful, but did it give you a type that you were happy with? All right, we doing okay here? Should have done this in, in the morning. Because I am racing through these. Um, anyway, decal type and decal val, this, these are not things that in the library fundamentals TS, but they're really handy because as you're doing things, we're not really limited to types. We can do things just to type members, like a type member type def. We can, we can test the blood, blah, 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 excuse me. You can test the validity of expressions. You can test uh, for member you know, member variables, all you need to do is express it in terms of a type. You know, you've done a bunch of, of spin A conditions. You're familiar with this. You have to turn things into a type. Um, fortunately, we have decal type and decal val make this easy. Um, example, detecting a member variable, right? Yes, huh, no, huh is again private, right? Here, here's our detection function. <coughs> Has foo equals decal type of t foo, right? If there is no t foo, the decal type will fail. If, there, if it's inaccessible, it'll fail because you'll get an access error. But now you can just say, is detected, has foo for yes? The answer is yes. For no, the answer is no. For huh, the answer is again no because it's inaccessible. Um, there's lots of places in the, the standard where basically it, Things change on the, uh, the behavior of various library components change based on the presence or the absence of a member type def. And it always says publicly accessible and unambiguously um, accessible, which basically means it, is, it has to be public or it has to be public in a base class. And unambiguously means you can't have it publicly, publicly available in two base classes that you're doing from. And this does all of that for you. You just, you know, you say, could I access it? And, and this will come back and say, yep, or nope, or.
this is the quietest presentation I've ever done at BoostCon. <laughs> Usually it's like people got all sorts of questions. So that must mean that, that this is all old hat for all of you and it's just like, yep, 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 great. In which case I'm going to be done very soon. Okay, um, detecting a member function. Um, okay, member function, here we go again, yes, huh, and no. Our, our test, our detection function, meta function, we say, if I have a T, can I call a foo with no parameters on it? Right, we can also, we could put things in, in here if we wanted to test that if the, um, if the foo took two parameters, could be called with one parameter, or two parameters, or parameters of a particular type. Now, now that doesn't mean that, in this case, I, we're not testing that foo, there's a foo with no parameters up there. We're testing that there's a foo that can be called with no parameters. This might have any number of parameters with default values. Okay? So, but it can be called, it, we're testing, can it be called with two of these, with no parameters, excuse me. And again, yes says yes, no says no, and huh says no because it's private. Yeah? So, huh and no basically are inaccessible, so why are you distinguishing them, or just to show that it works in both cases? Just to show that it works in both cases. Okay. Right, um, yeah, they're both, you know, I'm, I'm trying to show that it, it pays attention to access controls, public, private, protected. I should, maybe I should, at least one of these done protected. But the, the point is, is that, is that it's not really, it's not really testing that does this have a member function, is it, does this have a member function that you could call if you have one of these? Um, which is, you know, and again, with the, um, the member type, my first example, right, does it have a type, type def that you can use, right? If it's, if it's private, it doesn't really matter because you can't use it. Sorry. So it's protected. Mm -hmm. How's that gonna it's, work? It's, it... Okay, so with protected, sorry, you should finish. I should let you finish and I'll answer. Well, does it depend where you're gonna put this or? Uh... So with protected, if this was, if I said this said struct and said protected or class and said protected, we'd still get a no here because as an outsider from this class, you can't access it. You know, just the same as, just a second, Michael. Um, just the same as private. The only way you get access to it is inherit from it. Right? Is there a question in the back? Type function is in a type derived from that uh, base type of Okay, the question is, what if, this t what, if, what if we pass here to this, to this type function, um, a, a type that is derived from this, where, it, where this member was protected? What if the type function is defined in a derived type of something with a protected member? If the type function is de defined in a derived type, I don't know, because I don't know how, because I don't know how, where you define a type function matters that, hmm, interesting question, because, hmm, because that might be a way for you to pull a type out and make it public. I don't think so, but I'm not 100% sure. So the question was, let me try to repeat it, so that people, in case nobody heard it, what if the type function was defined in a class that had derived from something like ha, huh, that, except it had a protected type? Don't know, I'd have to try it. I saw another hand back here that was, ah, right there, Ansel. Um, where the type function is defined would just define who can do that type function. It would have nothing to do with what type it could introspect on. Okay. What, so, so the behavior would depend on where the static assert is, because that's the usage of the actual concrete type you're calling the type function on. Okay, so Ansel said that that it doesn't matter where the type function is defined, it's rather where the static assert was in fact placed because then it would have a context. Yeah. Yeah, next slide. Is there a reason you're doing maybe the one with the decimal 
Is was there a reason you did Deco Ballad T Rex rather than Deco Ballad T? Um, there. Is there a difference between that and that? Clearly, I thought there was, but I don't remember why. I think throughout these things, I, I, yeah. See here, I did Deco Ballad T and so on. I don't, I don't know. Okay, I need to go back and and be consistent and figure out which is the right one to use. Uh, I think he was first thing. Why uh, is Frederick not used to take up the Italians? I'm sorry. Why is the Frederick not? Oh, right here. This is this is the the function that you're you're testing, and and actually it doesn't have two template arguments. It has a variable number of template arguments, and then the rest of these, yes, in this case, being the only one, are the things you're testing. So I could have up here, I could have something that says type name T, type name U, and then I would have is detected, has foo, yes, comma no. And I think I have an example for that. Let me look, um, but. But yeah, th it, all of these examples have just one here, not because it requires one, but because I have to fit stuff on slides. Um, and a note about the, the, the stuff on the slides here. This all compiled and ran correctly, gave the correct answers. Well, it didn't run because there's nothing here that runs, but gave the correct answers, did all the static asserts passed before I put it on the slides. And so any, any bugs on here are due to me like fiddling with spaces to make everything fit. Um, also, you know, you can assume that the right includes are there and maybe even a using namespace something or other. But, you know, perils of slideware. Yes, Ansel. Is the pinky effect of having deco valve be a T rex here? Mm -hmm. Is that you are testing that there is a foo that is callable that is not R value qualified. Woo. I think. If if it if that's true, then that's not what I intended. So thank you. Not sure. Okay. Well, now I can go back and and, and play with it and see. Because I can write you know R value qualified things. That's right. That, Chandler. That is correct. Decoval T rest gives you a no value reference. Okay, and decoval T just gives you a T. Right? Okay, gives you an R value reference. Okay. Okay. Detecting a member function, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, we did, all right. Detecting member variable, we did this one. Detecting a member function, same thing. We, we see if we can call it with um, none, none of the above, or with no arguments. Again, not a not that it has no arguments. This is, by the way, as an aside, um, about this is one of the reasons that, that the standard library has like something in the front matter that I, people ask me about like every couple months. I'm trying to take a pointer to a standard library function. And I say, yeah, yeah, you can't do that. And I point at a particular part in the standard that says, no, you can't do that. And the reason is, is because you may think that there's, you know, there's a function called, you know, just pick one. You know, there's a function called memcopy or something, just to pick a really weird example, std memcopy, that takes three parameters, that takes void, void, size t, and returns a void pointer, void pointer, void pointer, size t, and returns a void pointer. But there's no guarantee that there's any such function like that in, in the standard library. All you, all the only guarantee you have is if you say, you write mem copy open paren and pass the right parameters in, something will get called and it will do what the standard says it's going to do. There might be extra parameters there. There might be a whole overload family there. You don't know, which is why you can't take the address of things. And actually, in, in, in extra standard, in thing, things that are not written out in the standard, it might be that it was marked always inline, <laughs> in which case, you can't actually get a pointer to it. If you want to get a pointer, if you want to have a pointer to a standard library function, it's really easy. You write a you write a lambda that calls it, and then take the pointer of the lambda. Anyway, 
off topic. Okay, but we're not limited to member functions. We detect a free function. We have here to have two functions named foo, one that takes an int, one that takes a string. Um, we say, what is the type of calling foo with one of these? Okay, we, remember we write our function here that always retur returns a type. It takes a t and returns the type of calling foo with what is it? And if you, you, know, you really wanted to be careful here, you would say colon, colon, foo, make it a global thing, but that would run off the end of the slide. So if I pass it along, it says, sure, I can do that. There's no longs up here, but what? Long is implicitly convertible to an int. Again, we're harnessing the power of the compiler to, to do our checking for us. We don't have to worry about implicit conversions because the compiler knows how to do that. We try it with a string. It says, sure, got one of those. If we try it with a complex of a double, it says, yeah, no, we can't do that because I don't know how to convert a complex double into a string or even into an int. Um, Again, we're, we can check for free functions. Um, the interesting thing also about this one is if instead you, you, you were to call, you were to look at the type return from is detected of foo res and long, um, anybody want to guess what it would be? Right, it would be int, which might be a little surprising to people. But because if you pass, if you say foo res int, you get int. Foo res of string, you get string. Foo res of long, you get int. Because it will end up, the overload resolution will select that one. Okay. We can also test for operators. Yay. We're not limited to things that we can actually write. Okay. Yes. Yes. If there's not actually any foo, then that will be a foo there will be it will it will this yeah what will happen is um, this type function will fail to fail to be satisfied and you will end up getting a false back from is detected. It won't be, it won't be a compiler error because uh, before the injection type foo. It's never seen any in our mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. You know what? If you come up after we're done, uh -huh. I'll, I'll, I will pull out my compiler and we'll try it. But I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you detect that that auto conversion from long to int is going to happen? So the question is can I detect whether the long to int conversion is going to happen? Um, Type yes. Case, yeah. They are all returning strings. Then, yeah. But see, hmm, if they're all returning strings, yeah. But see, is detected exact will tell you what the return type is. It won't tell you. So, so in that case, you can. In this case, you could tell which one was getting called. But I suspect you could write a type function. That, that did that check to see, you know, you could say to do what conversions are available. You know, if, you, if you're saying, you know, I want an int, I have one of these, is it convertible to an int? Okay, certainly, well, and actually, we have a type trait for that, it's called is convertible, std is convertible. But, you know, and you could daisy chain them together if you knew that you were looking at int or string, you could, you could actually write this yourself by saying, is this, Convertible to a int is this convertible to a string? Otherwise, error. Well, I'm more worried about you know if we're detecting something here, we got a long coming through. Right. Automatically converting that down to an int, you're going to lose the provision possibly. Possibly. I'm worried about that, being able to detect it. Yeah. Um, in this case, what we're testing, we're not testing that. We're just testing can can I call foo with a long? Um, and so you need you need to you need some other machinery to to figure out 
you know, at what conversions are happening. This is just telling you, yes, there is a successful conversion from long to something that foo will take. And it may be an identity conversion. If I had said int here, it would be a no conversion. Yeah? So um, I didn't. I did not hear all of what you said, but um, I heard about implicit conversions to long, and 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 then I lost it. So can you say that again, please? <laughs> oh, it was wrong. Okay, darn. Yes. Right, and actually, you know, the 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 in, the build the comment was you can prevent the the conversion by having you know int foo, int, you know long equals delete, but you have to write a lot of those because you'd want to write float and double and long double and long long and unsigned long and unsigned long long and so on. Yes. That's a really good question. The question is, um, what what about the um, case where one was sh where you had an inner namespace and and things were being shadowed? And the answer is that it follows the same rules as just calling it. And so yeah, you would you would get some shadowing problems. Um, this is not actually doing the lookup. Right, it's leveraging the compiler mechanism to do the lookup. So it it does it will behave exactly as the compiler does, which in most cases what you want to do exactly what you want because you want to know if you can call this. But yeah, it will not. It wouldn't find a foo in a nested namespace that that the, that these would shadow that that would be shadowed by these. Sorry. Good question though. No, oh, okay. Operators. We can also test for operators. Okay, here I have copy assignment, right? We have yes, huh, and no, and in this case, huh has a pretty kind of odd um, assignment hopper, copy assignment hopper. It returns void. Why? I don't know, because occasionally I run into classes in the wild where somebody has implemented their assignment operator, returns something other than a reference to whatever. But this is an example. So copy assign, we say, what is the type of assigning a tref to a from a t constref? This is an expression here, and we want to know what the type of this expression is. In this case, hey, my static asserts fit on one line. So copy assign tells me right tref tref, and yes, it succeeds, and no, it fails, and huh, also succeeds. Because you can actually assign a ha, huh, a const ha huh ref to a const to a ha huh ref. It just gives you a, a weird type. Void is a perfectly fine type. The, the, the type of this expression is void, which is odd, but not illegal. Um, it just means that, right, you can't, if you have a bunch of ha's, you can't say ha huh, a equals b equals c equals d, because the, the compiler will yammer at you. And you know you can also test for very odd, even odder than these. You can te you can test for move assignments, right? By changing this to ref not non const ref ref. You could you could see if somebody has done what auto pointer used to do, where the copy assignment came from a non const. Anyway, all sorts of things. But basically, with decalval and decal type, again, there's no code generated here. We imagine, just imagine that we have something of this type, and we have something of that type. And if we were trying to assign it, what would the resulting type be? So yeah, this all happens in an unevaluated context. No code gets generated to the compiler. We're just saying, you know, we're, we're saying, saying to the compiler, you know, you think about this, and we're going to look at the shadows on the wall, <laughs> see what happened. OK, but suppose you wanted to be like more precise. You wanted to say, does this have actually a sane operator? A sane assignment operator. Same three classes, 
Um, yeah, we had no, no was deleted last time. Same, the reason I did delete here instead of just leaving it out is because mm, compiler might generate me a copy assignment <laughs> operator by default, and I didn't really want that. Anyway, this is the same, okay? All, everything from here up is the same as the last slide, even though they're on different lines. Okay, but now instead of saying is detected v, which basically means did the detection succeed, we ask is detected exact v, it says we do copy assign and yes, same as before, but we say yes reference. Is the, the result of doing, a, of calling this type function with this parameter, does it actually get back to be yes reference? Um, so for yes, yes it returns a yes reference. For no, it has no assignment operator, so the substitution fails and is detected exact v is going to return you false because it's not a no because it doesn't exist at all. And for huh, it says yes I found, I have an assignment operator, we can do this, and the result of this type is what? Void. And is void the same as a huh ref? Well, no, and so it fails. And so you get, you can be as precise as you want on this. You can say, you know, it has to be this. There's also a, um, whoops, there's also a is detected or is detected convertible, which says, the type, did the type I get back from this, from evaluating this type function? Did this actually, um, is this convertible to some type I'm interested in instead of is it exactly? And that's really handy when you're doing, dealing with inheritance hierarchies. But, so, uh, it's just really nice for, uh, for doing all this. You don't have to write gang, gangs of is copy constructible, or is this, or is this, or is this, or is this, or you don't have to, in general, you don't have to make up your own type traits um, and figure out how to implement them. You just write things like this and let the compiler tell you what the answers are. Because the compiler, you know, there are people who spend their days writing, writing actual C++ code that does this, that does this stuff for you automatically. You don't have to actually emulate it using the type traits machinery. Okay, and yes, I have raced through all these, all my slides in 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that. And so, I'm at the end. So questions, more questions. One, two, three. I'm sorry? Sure. What would happen if I had a code as not a function? Um, a class type the question is if you had a, a a a class type or a struct here named foo that had a constructor that took a single argument yeah I think it would I've never tried that, but because all we're asking is, can can I write foo open paren with something of this type, and pass it in, and so, I you know what, it's a it's not clear to me either you would get, either it would just be fine, or you might get an error from the compiler that says this is ambiguous, in which case it would return false. He just did it and it works fine. There we go. I love this that. Love this crowd. It's like, and you, I can sit here and pontificate and hypothetical and give you a hypothetical answer. Says, no, I just tried it. It works. Um, who was second? I have a question. Yes. Um, in the earlier slide where you show up the execution only detected. Yep. Class, the detected class. Yes. Um, often we make simplification for our slides. Has there been any simplifications made on this slide? Nope. I mean, and, and if you want, I can, I can give you, I think I have a link to the Library Fundamentals TS at the end of the slides. This, 
If there's many, any simplifications here, it's because I copied it wrong. There we go. Um, Ansel, and then Dave. You had, you had your hand up. Yep. Whoops. If instead of calling foo directly mm -hmm. on this, if we set up a templated function mm -hmm. that was SCNAed out if its parameters didn't match exactly mm -hmm. the types of foo with a star added, and we called SCU decal val t star then you could detect an exact match, or at mm -hmm. least a pointer convertible match. Okay. I'm not quite sure how to write that function. Remember that they, you know, when you build an overload set, right, you, it, it builds all the pieces that, um, that you want, all the things that might possibly, and then it ranks them and it picks the best one. Mm -hmm. And a non-template function is always going to be, a non-template exact match is always going to be a better match than a templated function. Uh, so I'm not convinced that that will work as well as you think. I'm not talking about adding a template named foo. Okay. I'm talking about adding a templated function named, you know, bar. foo, or named bar, that only exists if its parameter uh -huh. is exactly the same type as some overload of foo. Okay. And I think you can get there with today with if. I, I wouldn't surprise me. And then, and then if you add a star to that type, okay. then you have a function bar that only takes values that are pointers mm -hmm. to the types that foo could have taken. Okay. You can test for does this T pointer match? Exactly. Exact, well, you can test for is it a convertible pointer? Mm -hmm. It would fix the int long case. Okay. It wouldn't fix base derived cases. So let me try to summarize that for the, the, uh, for the video. So basically what Ansel said was that you, you could in fact um, define another function bar which took, um, the, which was enabled if for pointers of a, of a particular type, enabled if only for say an int pointer, and then have it be a parameter which was the address of something returned from foo. Is that how you? Uh, no. Okay, I got it backwards then. <laughs> Say it again. I was saying declare a templated function bar. Yes. That only exists. Right, is enable if. Is enable if for if foo, if there is a foo with the parameter type with a removed pointer. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So if you passed an int star to bar, it would be valid. But if you passed a long star to bar, it would not, it would not be valid because long star is not convertible to int star. Did you want to say something about that? Um, I think you can do something uh, easier. You can just uh, define in this template named P with a just a parameter P, uh, parameter P. So you have um, you can just say uh, void foo take a P and this is not that you need and that you always need a cat net except, except you have an overload. Uh, that doesn't work because conversion happens before. Yeah, I th if you have a template that's an exact match, it will choose that, it will prefer that over a non-template that requires a conversion, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but then you have made it impossible to call foo with a log. Right. We may just want to be detecting so, exact so, so in, that, in that case, you do some namespace magic so that your overload only appears when you're doing the cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, St Stephen just said that you can, you can bury the check in a namespace. And, uh, and get around that. Do you have a comment? Yes, and uh, maybe you can uh, let Stephen uh, in a private to say two functions of template. One of which is in the first is that match, and the second one is delete. And the, I think that was one of the of Ansel's suggestion was that you have you have two foos, one templated. Oh, no. uh, well, in, inside the decal wall, P, inside oh. the P, you pass some record of P. Uh, 
father has two, two fingers on the left. One of which one of which is very has uh, exactly the exact mark. Mm -hmm. And the second one is on two plate and plate and the list. Ah. And so we said that inside here you can you can pass you can do, you can do something inside here with a helper class that actually detects if a conversion happens. Is that a fair a fair summary? Okay, and then you can detect if the conversion happened that way. Yes. I think Ansel's uh, solution also uh, gives us the possibility to explicitly check for a function that's called foo and not for a struct or a class that's called foo. Okay, so what he said was he believes that Ansel's solution would give you the ability to test exactly for a function whose name is foo. You're, you're, call, you're calling here a function named foo and not the constructor of a class named foo. Yes? How would we detect whether, whether or not foo is no exception? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I had enough trouble test, to te testing if, if the thing I was calling was, in fact, that const member function. That took me a while. So I'd have to think about that. Does anybody have an idea of how you would test for this, this expression being no except? Doesn't someone test this like you asked? Well, yeah, yeah, after you, after as, you a separate as a separate step, you could certainly do that. You could say, once, once I did this, once I know that I can call foo with uh, some of these, you could say, no except foo of, with, of t, or of decal type t. I see decal, decal val, I, I think it is, because it doesn't actually do anything. I can't imagine how it would throw an exception. Yeah, you, you could actually, on that slide, Jeff, just replace, I, I believe you could just replace decal type with no except. Yeah. And that will return you a Boolean. Right. Of, Right, but you but first you have to do this. You have to step through the is detected to make sure it's valid. True. And right. then and then after after you've done that, I don't I think if you just wrapped it in no except, if you just said no except, um, foo of complex decal val complex, um, double, I think you get a compiler. I think you get a hard compiler. I thought no except was also an unevaluated context. Okay, he, Ansel just said, I thought no, no except was also an unevaluated context, yes? Yeah. But it doesn't, it still has to give you an answer. Yeah, so what I, so I think if you wrap it in no except and then put the whole thing in integral constant, and then use is detected or, or is detected with a default value mm -hmm. of false, that should tell you if it exists and is no except. <laughs> nice. So he said that, so say that again, so because I think I understand it, but so you put your foo inside of in your there inside of and no except wrap the whole thing in an integral constant. Then when you use is detected, you give it you want to access what that type is, and you give a default of false type. So if it doesn't exist, it'll give you your default false type. If it does exist, it'll test whether it's no except. Sweet. Did everybody catch that? Because I'm going to have a hard time repeating it. Which one of you was first? So I, um, um, I think a no except is part of the type system C17. So you could declare a no except function pointer and try to assign it to foo or the other way around, right? In the decal type expression. Oh, you could declare, you could, you could say, um, the question was, no except in C17 is part of the type system, and so you could declare a, a type, which is a function pointer to something of, of some type, and try to assign foo to it. And, and no, the, the, your function pointer type that you're trying to assign to is da 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 da, no except. And yes, I believe that would work with the proviso, that that's a different test than what we have here. What we're testing here is, can I call foo with a parameter, a parameter of this type, and what your test is, is is there a function with exactly this signature that is no except? And so if, if I had written here int comma 
um, float f equals 3, I can still call that with a single long, but your test would, would not find it because it say there's no, there's no function int that takes just an int, or no function foo that just takes an int parameter. And so I think you get tripped up on default parameters. But, but that's one way to go if you don't have to worry about default parameters. Ben. Yeah, and then static asserting on that. <laughs> yes, um, he said that you can detect uh, const expert time. You can detect if something's const expert by trying to, you know, trying to create an integral constant of the right type with the value of the expression, comma true, or a boolean constant, comma true. And that will fail to compile if it's not a, it's not a compiled time expression. Yes. All right, now there's an interesting thought. Right, you can take you can take a take this function and wrap it in a no except lambda. Right? And then and then pass it through here. Is that what you're saying? And then it will tell you if if that works. Okay. Chandler. Yeah. So, I really like this idiom, but I feel like it's a bit inverted. What I would kind of like is, is instead of a meta function on type, I would like a context for variable template. So that the detection stuff happens once, and then I can reuse it by just supplying a template parameter, one template parameter. I want to write has foo angle yes, close angle. Nothing else. And the sure. Ah, as opposed to. Right. So, right? like, um, the, question, the question I'm asking is, has who yes? Right, but you're asking to, you. In this case, what? That's not the question you're asking. What you're asking is, is has who bracket yes well formed? Um, okay, let's, let's sit down and work on that afterwards. The reason I like this is because you can build up a library of these and you can apply them over and over again. Sure, sure, sure. I, so, just, want, I just want, like, wherever possible to actually, like, quickly go all the way down to a variable template to make the, mm -hmm. the, the actual semi specialization much easier to read. Right, and we have is detected v, has foo, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I did colon colon value because because yeah. I'm old school. Sucks. <laughs> Sucks to be me. Okay. Um, I also have a whole pile of references, papers. Um, these are Walter's two talks. Um, they're well worth watching if you're interested in template mode programming. A bunch of the stuff he talks about, this was for a CPPCon audience, so there were some people in the room who were not altogether comfortable with um, template metaprogramming, so the audience here might find them to start out a little slow, but he, he gets to the meat of the matter fairly quickly. And you know, I watched them both just like a couple months ago, and they're, they're, they're very well done. Um, these are the, the papers. The, this paper actually talks a lot about how people might use the detection idiom and so on, as opposed to the stuff in the, in the library fundamentals 2, which just you know blots it out there. Here it is. Yes. Sort of on that Jesus note, um, am I interpreting it correctly? This would allow us to write a very simple version of a CRTP interface that can be partially semantic. We can just enable it out the functions they don't. So the question is, does, would this allow us to, to, um, to write a, uh, a, 
basically a generic boilerplate CRTP um, setup that lets you if or spin out the functions you um, you don't want. I think so, but I'd want to go play Chandler. For CRTP, why do you need this? The the, the derived class immediately ties the name from the base class. But if you have a function that they don't implement, then the static casting bit says I can't static cast and call that function, right? So Chandler said Chandler said that if was questioning the need for this because um, because the the drive class can immediately implement things or not, and the response was well it that then it hides the things in the in the CRTP base and you have to static cast back to that too. Well, that may be an offline discussion. There's a okay. chance to use the CRTP that allows you to not use the spin IO way. Some things you want to set up. Yeah, it's entirely possible. I just haven't seen that. Okay, so. Chandler's comment was that there's an idiom you can use with CRTP that allows you not to shadow um, things in the CRTP base. To, to always shadow. Okay. To extra casting. To always shadow without extra casting. Sorry, got to get that right. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.